pandemic. Little did any of us realize the impact the pandemic would have on our, how we go about our work and our daily lives. This was the first domino to fall. It catalyzed a series of political, economic, and social challenges which required a multilateral response. People were suffering. Those who were in the most precarious situations prior to the pandemic were pushed closer to the brink at risk of being left behind permanently. My challenge was to reinstate the international community. As member states came to terms with the health crisis and related crises within their own borders, it was up to me as President of the General Assembly to rally the membership to commit to collective solutions for the people we serve. In this past year has taught us uh, one thing, it is that nothing is certain. We need to evolve in peace and in pace with the rapidly developing world we are operating within. Make no mistake, I repeat again that multilateralism is the only path forward. The people of the world made this quite clear when surveyed last year. They want a United Nations that is fit for purpose, able to meet the challenge of the day, and the United Nations we need for the future we want. However, we have a long way to go before we meet the targets of the 2030 the agenda for sustainable development, uphold universal human rights, uh, or achieve peace worldwide. COVID-19 has resulted in a loss of lives and livelihoods. The impact of the pandemic has hit the most vulnerable the hardest. As we face the deepest global economic recession since the Great Depression, Global extreme poverty numbers are expected to rise as 115 million people are on the verge of falling into extreme poverty. 235 million people will need humanitarian aid this year. Approximately 690 million people are at risk of malnutrition. This has knock-on effects. In 22 countries, Violence and conflict are the root causes of hunger. Millions of people are on the move, displaced due to conflict, persecution, hunger, and climate change. Women and girls have experienced gender-based violence at an unprecedented rate. Children are at high risk for child labor, child marriage, and trafficking. Xenophobia racism and discrimination on ethnic and religious grounds are on the rise. Violence against members of religious groups and places of worship have been increasing. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we need to take urgent action now to reverse these trends. The multilateral system has suffered a great trauma as a result of this pandemic. Business as usual will not put us on the road to recovery. Now is the time for the defibrillator. We need to shock to the system. That is what we are doing. And the United Nations is working to meet the needs of the people we serve when they need us most. The General Assembly is calling on all member states to come forth with solutions to the most critical problems facing the people we serve. Just last week, I convened a meeting on the situation in Palestine, following a joint request from Chair of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and the Chair of the Arab Group. I convened this meeting in large part to compensate for the silence and deadlock in the Security Council. The Security Council must shoulder its responsibilities and overcome yet again its paralysis on this longest standing item of its agenda. Inaction on this issue undermines and indeed hinders the ability and credibility of the Council and the United Nations 
regarding other pressing peace and security issues. I hope that we will hear a unified voice from the Security Council on this important and urgent subject. As for the General Assembly, we assumed our responsibility under the Charter of the United Nations and met to address the grave violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. These violations caused the loss of lives of four hundreds of innocent Palestinians, majority of which were children and women. The announcement of a ceasefire, as the UN General Assembly was still in meeting, was a significant development, and I claim that it was because the General Assembly brought this issue into its agenda that all the silent uh, organs started talking about ceasefire and they were reacting to the difficult situation. I issued an appeal for peace paper on, on the responsibility of the chair of the General Assembly. And it also showed that when the General Assembly takes the lead and member states speak up together, we get results. I am aware of this opportunity to commend His Excellency the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Pakistan for taking the time to participate in this meeting in person and for this strong stance in support of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. We have a duty to prevent any further erosion of international law. It's critical to support those who survive the attacks since they remain dependent on a weak health care system with inadequate equipment and constant drug shortages. COVID-19 pandemic is a further setback to the already dire situation. Moving forward, the institutional record of the UN clearly prescribes how to translate words into action when it comes to the Palestinian issue. We need a swift return to negotiations with a goal of ending the occupation, addressing all final status issues, including the status of Jerusalem, and achieving two independent, sovereign, viable states, Israel and Palestine, living side by side in peace, security, and mutual recognition within the recognized borders on the basis of the pre-1967 lines with Jerusalem as the capital of both states. These words are actually the constitution of what will be the future of the Palestinian issue. We must never forget these sentences, words. It is, it is the limit the world can accept in this tragedy. I assure you the General Assembly will not relent until there is peace in the Middle East. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am also aware of the situation in Jammu and Kashmir. I am aware how an ordinary Pakistani must feel about Jammu and Kashmir when they feel so strongly about Palestine. Jammu and Kashmir is just miles away from here. There is a little doubt in my mind that peace, stability and prosperity in the South Asian, Asian region hinges on normalization of relations between Pakistan and India. This in turn is subject to the two countries finding a resolution of the Jammu Kashmir dispute. Throughout my term, and consistent with the UN policy and applicable UN Security Council resolutions, I have encouraged all parties to refrain from changing the status of the disputed territory. This dispute is as old as Palestine. As President of the General Assembly, I call upon India and Pakistan to pursue the path to peaceful resolution of the dispute. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and, and gentlemen, similarly, it is critical to bring peace to Afghanistan. Pakistan is a host to millions of Afghans, with generally we're speaking how difficult it was in the beginning, but how I think uh, bravely and humanely the issue was treated for so many decades. It's 40 years now. This country has borne the burden when the international committee's support dwindled. I commend the people of Pakistan for hosting this community in need. 
We also know that lives of Afghanistan and Pakistan are now inextricably intertwined. Peace in Afghanistan is an imperative for Pakistan to open trade route to landlocked Central Asia. Peace in Afghanistan is critical for securing benefits from China-Pakistan economic corridor. Peace in Afghanistan is central to the promotion of human rights. Peace in Afghanistan must be Afghan-led and Afghan-owned. I commend Pakistan's leadership and its role in supporting the efforts to forge reconciliation, security and transition in Afghanistan. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the General Assembly has also met multiple times to discuss the situation in Syria. A decade of that displacement and destruction has left the Syrian people with little hope. Aerial and artillery bombardments have reduced cities to rubble. Beautiful cities like Aleppo and other cities in Syria is not existing anymore. All the beauty has been torn down. Starvation is used as a weapon of war. Humanitarian needs are increasing at a rate that existing capacities may not be able to meet. More than half of the pre-conflict population is displaced. We have four million Syrian refugees in my country. And we're, of course, also suffering the economic difficulties caused by this, uh, by having so many um, refugees in, in the country. I've recently visited the Turkish-Syrian border to meet with Syrian refugees in person. And my visit confirmed my conviction that we must ensure the safe and unimpeded access of humanitarian assistance to Syrians, particularly in northwest Syria, where the needs are most profound. There are four doors. Only one is open due to the Security Council decision. And we are trying to open the four doors, but also trying to save the only door open so that the humanitarian aid can continue. Furthermore, I remain deeply concerned about the situation in Myanmar. Just yesterday, I visited Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh, where I heard the first-hand accounts of Rohingyas who suffered unimaginable violence and persecution. The safety and security of the Rohingya and other minorities must be secured in line with the order of the International Court of Justice issued last year. I have called upon the global leaders and neighbors of Myanmar to continue to work resolutely towards an end to the violence in Myanmar. I call on all leaders to act in the interest of Myanmar's democratic reform, engaged in meaningful dialogue, refrain from violence, and to fully respect human rights, fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law. Let us not forget that it is our shared responsibility, and I quote, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small. This is in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. After 75 years, we must continue to strive to uphold and promote the human rights of everyone, everywhere. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there is no easy solution to these crises. However, when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have one key to unlock our collective recovery, and it's vaccines. I welcome the recent steps taken within the World Trade Organization. This will enable us to expand vaccines for all. I started a campaign in New York, which is called Vaccines for All, seeing that the danger was going to face us in the future. This was in November that I started the campaign. And this is critical now at this moment. Only 0.3% of all vaccines have been given to low-income countries. None of us is safe until everyone is safe. So countries must refrain from stockpiling all the vaccines for, the, for themselves 
while many other countries in other parts of the world suffer and don't have any access to vaccines. We must look at the forest, not only at the trees. If the forest is burning, it doesn't matter if you have a nice flower garden and you give water to it. it. The fire will come to your garden and destroy your flowers as well. Widespread vaccination uptake will maximize the impact of the unprecedented fiscal injection into health services and social supports the government of Pakistan undertook last year. I commend also what the Pakistani government has done until now. I was here in August last year before taking office as the President of the General Assembly. Even that time, comparatively, Pakistan is in, was in good situation. And today, again, comparatively, the measures taken by the government is giving results. Of course, nothing is giving us a zero result. We don't have any incidents at all. But I think at this stage, whatever we can do to lower down the numbers and save our people is the important thing. And I have seen that Pakistan is doing this, and I'm, I'm very happy. The digital technologies harnessed to disperse emergency cash assistance prior to and during COVID-19 pandemic to 100 million of the most vulnerable citizens and small businesses demonstrate how developing countries can leapfrog into the digital era to support financial inclusion. This is essential as we recover, because digital is one of the key elements we now face. We are happy that digital was with us. We had, we continued our meetings, discussions through digital possibilities, but we must also again look at the forest. In, in the United States, 42 million people doesn't have access to Wi-Fi. In the world, 100 million, 800 million people doesn't have electricity, which is a clear indication that they don't have digital capacities as well. If we're talking about education, if we're talking about health facilities, if we're talking about improving the quality of uh, business or improving the education capacities of our children, Digital is the key word for the future. So indeed, uh, the decade of action and delivery to implement the sustainable development goals has become the decade of recovery. And this jeopardizes our progress as even prior to the pandemic, we have not been reaching global targets on time. The United Nations as an institution cannot deliver the SDGs. It is the government policies and implementation of those policies that will lead to progress. I again avail this opportunity uh, to commend Pakistan for its commitment to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The political will and leadership of the Pakistani government on the establishment of parliamentary task forces on SDG implementation and its integration in Pakistani's Vision 2025 has been critical in translating the SDGs from policy to action. Large-scale climate change mitigation measures, such as the planting of 10 billion trees in the next three years, will have an enduring impact well past this decade of action to implement sustainable development. Pakistan has demonstrated consist consistent uh, thought leadership in nature-based solutions to climate change. And I look forward to hearing of your plans as we look ahead towards COP in Glasgow. Indeed, the, we have a very good coincidence that the three Rio conventions uh, pres present a historic opportunity to galvanize synergies across the climate, biodiversity, and desertification, land degradation, and drought agendas. I trust that Pakistan will engage in the upcoming high-level dialogue on desertification, land degradation, and drought, which was postponed in light of the situation in Gaza, but it will take place in June. 
and we will be very happy to have uh, representation from Islamabad in New York as well. Of course, planetary health is but one aspect of sustainable development where Pakistan is making gains towards the targets of the sustainable development goals. I recently convened, convened the high-level thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity. The debate also highlighted the digital cooperation organization of which Pakistan was a founding member. This initiative bringing together seven countries with 1.2 trillion in combined GDP and a combined population base close to 480 million, 80% 80 of whom are under 35 years of age, is another example of Pakistan's pivotal role in South-South cooperation to create a future where no one is left behind. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan is ably represented in New York by His Excellency Minur Akram, Ambassador and Permanent Representative for Pakistan to the United Nations, but also the President of the Economic and Social Council for its 76th session. We have continuously worked and coordinated towards maintaining the ongoing cooperation between the two organs, the General Assembly and the ECOSOC, in order to enhance coherence and synergies across their respective works for the session. This has been most evident in sustainable development issues relating to infrastructure, countries in special situations, least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states, desertification, land degradation and drought, and financing for development. Ambassador Akram has consistently highlighted the necessity for private sector engagement on financing and the urgent response required for countries in significant debt distress. Pakistan is demonstrating leadership at the highest levels of multilateralism as one of the five heads of the principal organs of the United Nations. I also commend His Excellency Imran Khan, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, for highlighting the importance of ending illicit financial flows at the general debate earlier this year. For our best efforts to achieve the 2030 agenda will be derailed unless there is full financial transparency. It's critical that work to end all criminal activity which jeopardize our efforts towards a safe, just, and sustainable future. And I trust that the UN General Assembly special session against corruption, which will take place next week, will accelerate multilateral efforts to end the scourge, hampering our progress towards 2030. In the same spirit, good efforts towards implementing the Sustainable Development Goals and maintaining peace will be undermined unless significant efforts are made to uphold the human rights of women and girls. If we are to create change, we need to move beyond rhetoric. We need to end gender-based violence for once and for all. Through stronger legislation against gender-based violence, reporting and redress mechanisms for victims, data collection, election observation, and violence monitoring, we will make progress this will allow to facilitate the full, equal, and meaningful participation of women in society, the workforce politics, and public life. Women bear brunt of conflict and their needs must be met. Women need to be included in all elements of peacekeeping and peace building. As an international gender champion myself, I firmly believe that the world must recommit to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda 20 years after its creation. Not only do women make a positive impact on peacekeeping environments, including supporting the role of women in building peace and protecting women's rights, in all fields of peacekeeping, women peacekeepers have proven that they can perform the same roles to the same standards and under the same difficult conditions as their male counterparts. Put simply, it is an operational imperative that we recruit and retain female, female peacekeepers. 
I commend the deployment of the first ever Pakistani female engagement team to South Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I thank these distinguished peacekeepers for their service to humanity. Indeed, I thank all of you who have served under the blue flag. You are the lifeblood of the United Nations. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to address you here in the National Defense University, which has been the home of many Pakistanis peacekeeping personnel over the six decades since the first deployment to the UN peacekeeping operations in, in Congo. I applaud the 4,732 men and women currently serving in nine UN peacekeeping operations around the world. And I commend the professionalism and dedication of the Pakistani military, police, and civilian personnel in these missions. Wearing the blue helmet, Pakistani peacekeepers are on the ground in some of the most dangerous missions in the world, putting their lives at risk to secure a better future for the most vulnerable people on this world. This scope and intensity of conflicts has changed dramatically since Pakistan first contributed troops in 1960. Today, we are seeking peace in an increasingly complex environment of parallel traditional and non-traditional threats, such as climate change, rapid technological developments, famine, infectious diseases, scarcity of water, and sanitation. To this end, I welcome the gains made advancing the Action for Peace initiative. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, from the moment I took office, my main concern and responsibility has been ensuring the uninterrupted and effective functioning of the General Assembly. Since the beginning of the 75th session, the General Assembly has held all mandated events and high-level meetings, sometimes in an innovative hybrid format to allow virtual participation. This has been critical to ensuring the full implementation of mandates, enhancing dialogue and cohesion among member states, and guaranteeing the membership a strong, functional General Assembly that meets the challenges facing the notions of the world and the people we serve. I have now spent some time elaborating on my views of multilaterals. But if I had to sum it up in one sentence, I would have said this. I truly believe that the future of multilateralism lies in an agile, effective, and responsive General Assembly that is underpinned by political will to uphold the rights of everyone, everywhere. I thank you very much. صدر اقوام متحدہ جنرل اسمبلی کا نیشنل ڈیفینس یونیورسٹی سے خطاب انہوں نے اپنے خطاب میں کہا کہ مشرق وسطی میں ہم تک جنرل اسمبلی چین سے نہیں بیٹھے گی مقبوضہ کشمیر کی صورتحال کا باخوبی علم ہے کرونا نے دنیا میں بڑے معاشی مسائل کو جنم دیا ان مسائل کا حل مشترکہ لاہ عمل سے ہی ممکن ہے عالمی قوانین کے خلاف ورزی سے کئی فلسطینیوں کی جانیں گئیں فلسطین کے مسئلے پر اقوام متحدہ جنرل اسمبلی نے اجلاس بلایا